Welcome to our podcast. This is Friends on Fire. I'm Mike. I'm a lifelong devotee of financial independence. I even wrote a book about it. And I'm Maggie, a newer convert, but just as passionate, especially on the intersection of minimalism and financial independence. We're one in the same. We are two like-minded friends who believe that talking about money with your friends and family opens the door to financial well-being. The Friends on Fire podcast is about dispelling myths, building financial acumen, and sharing your financial independence journey with the people you care about. This is Friends on Fire. Well, hi. Welcome to Kirsten and Julian from Rich and Regular. We are so happy to have you and we really appreciate your time tonight. Hello. It's so good to see you, Maggie and Mike. <laughs> what was that? Hello. I like that, that was, was a nice hello. <laughs> that was my that was true excitement. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what happens when you're in quarantine for a year. You start it singing is. your it's hellos like, in a Bridgerton accent. People. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Wait, people. I, I don't want to get too off topic right off the bat, but are you guys obsessed with Bridgerton as well? Oh, because I am. I love that I, show. I've not started this yet. I feel left out. What? It's so good. The queen is like one of my favorite TV characters of all time. <laughs> She's a boss. Yeah, oh, she definitely God. is. It's she just, okay. I, I laugh out loud <laughs> at her facial expressions every time she's on screen. She is magnificent, um, <laughs> but she's she's definitely not a, a role model. Um, <laughs> Based on the fact you said she's just, she's a cokehead, I'm assuming that. I mean, when have you ever seen that It was that normal back then. I mean, it was like. Maybe. Regular. Yeah, was, anyway. <laughs> not like rich and regular. That's not no, yet. Okay. That's different. <laughs> Um, but no, okay. I'm, not, I'm not crazy about the show, but I did watch it. I thought it was, I thought I love a good story. I am obsessed with good stories these yeah. days. And so that is one that sucked me in and I was very excited about it. I, I like it. it. Well, maybe it needs to be, I mean, I, I keep hearing everybody talk about it. I'm in the middle of Handmaid's Tale, which is very mm. intense and I can't mm. really handle anything else right now until I get through this and then have some time. You need process. a palate cleanser of Bridgerton I need, when you're done. I, need, I don't yeah. think Bridgerton, well, maybe it's a palate cleanser. We'll see. It it could be, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but hands it, like Handmaid's Tale is, is, is too intense for right now for me. It's a lot. Yeah. 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 It's, it's too Julian, close. we watched Narcos. Ooh, and now he wants Narcos. to do um, Game of Thrones. So he likes intensity. I do. In yeah. intense moments. Yeah. I know. I, I sometimes find certain TV like stresses me out when I'm already stressed, and I'm like, I need something that's like lighthearted and stuff. Uh, okay, well, we've already Mike. Mike, usually I'm Sorry. the one to get us off track, <laughs> but yeah. I will say we'll tie this back in because Julian, you just said you love a good story. Okay. You guys have a great story, so let me give a little bit of an introduction and just some context. So we met. I first met both of you over a decade ago, and I don't even honestly I can't remember which of you I met first. Um, and not that I would expect you to remember that either. Um, but I still remember when I found out that you two were dating and I was mm-hmm. like, I really, I thought, I thought very highly of both of you. And so I was like, oh my gosh, this is an adorable couple. And this is like a new power couple. Um, and I just thought it was awesome. And I knew your awesomeness would multiply when you got together. And it clearly did because you guys went on to create rich and regular. And I know, so you created rich and regular in 2017, I believe, it has grown into an award-winning blog, a very successful social platform, a media brand. You guys are now in the process of writing a book with the world's largest publisher, Penguin Random House. Super impressive. And your mission is to inspire better conversations about money. So on that note, we want to just welcome you and then have some conversations about money. Thank you. I'm, 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 I'm blushing. Uh, but I was also pausing since when I said hello, it was apparently a bit too much. Hello! <laughs> 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 scared you from talking. Um, so. <laughs> right. So I was left some dead air there. Hopefully you're going to clean that up. But, uh, but no, thank you so much. We're happy to be here. Yeah, you're welcome. We, uh, we're excited to have you here. And you can say hello however you'd like. So Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so b- before we get in, Perhaps for our listeners who might not be following you already, how would you two introduce yourselves? If we met at a dinner party, how would you two introduce yourselves? Uh, probably with just our names. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, we're, I mean, the regular in our, in our brand is capitalized because we identify as regular people. We don't, um, we don't emphasize the rich or even the entrepreneurial. Like, obviously that comes up because typically the question after is, what's your name is what do you do 
And that's when we start the conversation of, you know, we're self-employed and um, sometimes we'll say we're entrepreneurs, but people have like, it's such a weighted word. So when we say self-employed, people are more curious about the kind of work that we do, which then leads into a conversation about money and personal finance and media. And we're just, we're a lot of fun at (laughs) cocktail parties. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to joke, you're you're probably not sure how to answer that dinner party reference because like none of us have been to a dinner party or socialized in person with that many people lately. So yeah, I'm definitely rusty. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> that's, that's why I'm we not got like that. sing my hellos, rusty. I was going to say, yeah. that's why we got the rusty hello, you know, poor guy like hasn't been able to say hello to anyone. I know. Know? I know it's pretty bad. I, I normally just say uh, I'm a blogger. Um, oh, that's another I really way. do. I, I love that title. Um, it's the one that that fits the best or the most comfortably to me, but it, it is it is limiting in some ways. So um, but yeah, I just say I'm a blogger because it also just means that people won't dig that much deeper. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. OK, I have recently heard both of you. And I can't remember where I heard this, honestly, but I've heard you both say or one of you say that you were tired of talking about how you got here and that you want to talk about where you're going. So we re- was that right? Did I make that up? That sounds like Sound me. Sound familiar? Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So <laughs> we want to spend a little bit of time focusing on, on that. So we're, we're not going to dig into too much of like how you started the blog. I know you guys talk about that all the time. Um, but one of the topics that we do want to talk about before we get into some more kind of general money topics is a little bit to dig into kind of your experience in corporate America. And because that is something that we've not all just shared in common in terms of corporate America, but literally, if I didn't say that at the beginning, all four of us have worked at the same company. Mike Mm -hmm. and I still work there. You two used to work there. And I I actually went to LinkedIn and did the math because I wasn't quite sure. Anyone have any guess on our uh, combined years of experience? at this company? 35 years. Uh, I was going to say 33. That's impressive. That's uh, pretty good. Kirsten, you win. It's about yes. 36. I, mean, I didn't get it down to the month, but it's about 36 years. I forgot how long, I knew how long I had been here. I forgot how long both of you had been there also. Um, so, I mean, you two have over a combined decade there. I'm sure you remember it. Uh, when you're like, yep, no, I remember every minute of it. Um, <laughs> but, and Mike, you're just a little baby there, right? So you, you've got like two and a half years under your belt. Uh, but we've, we've clocked a lot of time working at the same company. So we, we've, there's something in that kind of shared experience of, I think a lot of big corporate jobs are very similar in different ways, but every company has kind of, you know, its own culture and idiosyncrasies and all those things. And we've all had different experiences. So I've heard you guys say before, and I think I heard this in your YouTube series, Money on the Table, um, when you were talking about, I don't remember the title of it, but it was like episode three, Race in Corporate America, something like that, that you, just that part of your experiences was around, you know, not wanting to bite the hand that feeds you. Mm. And and when you, you know, speak up and speak out about certain things that, that weren't working for you or not just working for you, but that weren't right you were putting your livelihood at risk. And I love one of the things that you said was, if you take a shot at the powerful, you better hit, you know, and that just, Mm -hmm. that that is a very, uh, I don't know, quotable soundbite. And so I think perhaps the point you were making is when you were working in corporate America, you didn't necessarily feel like you could speak your truth and that it wouldn't have some sort of adverse impact on you or right negative impact on you in some way. I think you're well past that point. I assume you guys would agree that you feel more comfortably, you know, speaking openly about kind of what that experience was like. And so that's a little bit of what we want to dig into tonight. So, you know, looking back on it now, how do you feel about your experience just broadly in corporate America? Like, and I'll give you an example. Like I was kind of thinking about this, like, is it a fond ex-boyfriend that like had his flaws, but you learned something from him but you still don't really ever want to see him again? Or is it like some toxic ex-boyfriend that you don't ever want to like see or think or talk about again? You know, you don't have to use that exact, but you know what I mean? Like, like how would you describe that relationship? I'm going to start. Um, I would say that's actually pretty accurate. It's, it's a little bit of both of those characters. Like it's, it's like an ex that like, if I never see you again, 
Like it wouldn't bother me one bit. Um, but because I spent so much of my time, uh, my life really working at that company and uh, fun fact, my father actually worked for that company before it was called uh, IHG. And so, um, or you can bleep that up, but my, um, no, no, I, heard, I heard you say that in the kids episode Yeah, and I, and I never realized that. Yeah. And so, you know, if you think about, you know, going back to Mike's earlier question about like how you would uh, introduce yourself, you know, I remember being at a point where I was thinking about my narrative and even the way that I introduced myself, um, oftentimes, especially in interviews, right, I would sort of tell that romantic story about how the company had always sort of been a part of the family, uh, even before I worked there. Um, And so, but it didn't end on such a rosy note for me. Um, it, it actually ended in a really, really um, bad and traumatic way, um, dare I say heartbreaking. Um, but I look back and very similar to a breakup, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. Because now as an entrepreneur, if I hadn't gotten my heart broken, um, I don't know that I would have been forced to find the courage inside to speak my truth. Um, which also led me to telling the story of other people who've been through similar experiences as I have. Um, And that has since led to us being able to build a platform, a community, tell these other stories, et cetera. So I'm grateful for the experience without question. I know that without those um, good and bad moments, I I, I would have significantly fewer stories to tell. Um, But um, I'd be lying if I said that there weren't moments where it was really, really harmful um, and hurtful painful and just really, really, really bad because um, it got really, really bad for me at the end. And I did not see it coming. Um, But when I did, I'm so grateful for Kirsten and um, honestly, the journey that we'd been on before, because it gave me the power to walk away pretty quickly. It was like, you know what? I don't have to deal with this. That's the benefit. You know, granted, we've not hit our number yet, but I have certainly enough uh, to be able to walk away and then not have a negative impact on my livelihood. That's fascinating. And I want to unpack that in a minute, but Kirsten, what would you say? Yeah, mine was um, far less toxic than Julian's situation. Um, I guess it would be like the the ex-boyfriend that you remember fondly, but it's like the one who never proposed. Like mm. you were dating for like nine, 10, 15 years, you got all this history. But when you ask like, what are we doing? It's kind of like, I don't know, we're just figuring things out. Um, So like, we're uh, we're keeping it casual. We're keeping it cash. Like what's the rush? Um, And so for me, it was just more of a a thing where the pace of my personal growth was faster than any sort of career growth. And it just was a, it was a mismatch at the end of the day. Like, I just didn't see the relationship continuing and us both benefiting in the same way. So one of the things that we're, you know, we definitely want to dig into are some of the challenges you faced and the learnings that you had from those challenges. But before we do, you know, going back to the (laughs) ex-boyfriend metaphor, you know, I think, you know, in relationships, people learn things about themselves and they develop personally from those relationships. And so when you look back on your time in corporate America, how do you think you you grew from those experiences? How are you a different person because you had that time there? Uh, there's a lot uh, for me. Um, I'm trying to think of what, what, what's the best sort of example that I can that I can give. Um, As an entrepreneur, I learned uh, what it takes to be considered world class. Um, As a, um, I guess, middle manager, (laughs) I I learned just some of the struggles of being, um, I guess, in the middle of that sandwich, right? Because you start to feel the pressure of the pyramid, if you will, uh, or the limitations, if you will, right at that point, right? There's significantly more opportunities available the further down you are, uh, let's say, in the uh, in the org chart. But right in the middle, it starts to get <laughs> really weird because you feel like you've got what it takes, but there are significantly fewer seats and offices for you to move into. Um, and so, you know, if you're not careful, you can run into a situation where you um, where you start to resent the environment, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, I actually did not have that problem. <laughs> I was, um, 
you know, I was fine. You know what I mean? And because again, I was on this path and, you know, we didn't even need my income. And so it was, in fact, I think it made me a better worker because I didn't have to, or nor was I willing to play any of the political games. I didn't need to. I was actually just purely focused on doing the job. Um, but what that led to was a realization that that's not what people were looking for. And that was a different form of heartbreak for me. It was like, oh my gosh, they actually want me to pretend to solve a problem that they know can't be fixed, as opposed to just sort of accepting the realities of the situation that we were in and sort of you know, trusting me or the team that we'd assembled as experts and say, hey, you know, we should probably pivot. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it was, it was tough, man. And there were so many other things going on, but long story short, I learned a lot about myself as a worker. Um, I learned about a lot about what I was capable of. Um, but I think most importantly, with given the sort of type of conversation that I think we're trying to have, I learned about how money sort of, um, shapes people's uh, truths, if you will. Um, like we, I found that I think people with certain jobs are um, unfortunately not even, dare I say, allowed to just tell the truth. They're, they're actually encouraged to tell a version of the truth that I think fits within the parameters of let's say the organizational culture or the direction that they're going in, or even dare I say the pressure that has been put on them from someone who, or people that sit above them. And, and I learned that dynamic um, and how deep it can uh, sort of fester inside of you if you start to internalize it, because it, you start to bring that home, right? And it's really is a bit of a mind bleep after a while, because it's like, man, I, I thought this was the case. I thought the sky was blue, you know, and um, you realize in, in some cases it's, it's, it's not. So I know that's a bit abstract, but it's, it's, yeah. I don't know if this is a similar point to, to what you're saying, Julian, but when you were saying that it was reminding me of, of a way that I often feel that again, I think is, is kind of what you're saying, but as someone who's been at the company for a long time, I often have to watch myself because I'll, I, I see, I seem to be the person in the room who's like, Hey, you know, we tried that like six times and it didn't work. And that doesn't like win you a lot of friends, but it's true. Like there is truth in learning from history. So I'm not saying we shouldn't push the limits and be innovative and everything else, but there are many times where I he hear people going down a path and I'm like, Hey, if you just, I'm not saying you shouldn't go down that path, but might you want to hear what happened the last three times we sent someone down that path? Cause the same thing happened every time. And I, I often have to catch myself cause it's like a lot of people don't want to hear that. Um, and it just, what you were saying kind of, I don't know, r reminded me of, of that experience that I've also myself had. Yeah. It, 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 it reminds me very much of, I want to say it was Steve Jobs that had something to say with respect to like, if hire smart people and let them do their jobs, you know what I mean? Like don't get in the way and insert, you know, opinions that you aren't even qualified to, to offer. And again, I say that at the risk of sounding arrogant, but I've had my, my own experience with that. I've seen other people have experience with that. And for me, as someone who really, really enjoys getting things done, that was really, really frustrating. Cause it was like, man, it, it was almost as if we would rather, you know, craft the perfect story about what could be done or what's possible or the direction that we're going in over and over again, as opposed to sort of accepting certain truths and moving forward that way. And so it, we just, it, there was this a, a growing misalignment in terms of how we viewed the world and how we viewed the, yeah. the tasks at hand. You also said you were a better worker because you didn't need the income. And I think that is something, and I know you guys talk about this a lot too, but that is something beautiful that comes from financial independence. And, and I feel it myself. There's a lot of things where I was once, you know, cautious to say certain things or to be a certain way. And I have no fear now. Like, I don't like, what are you going to do to me? Fire, okay, cool. Fire. Like, <laughs> please do. Actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go for it. Let's see what happens, you know? Um, and I, and, I, and, and I mean, Mike, I know, I know you uh, feel a similar way and we talk about that, but it doesn't mean I don't have pride in my job right. and it doesn't mean I don't care about doing things a certain way, but I don't get caught up in like playing the game and, you know, doing things a certain, you know, it, I just, I, I am much more true to what I care about and what I think is right. And, 
how I want to be as a person and, and as a leader. And as you know, a lot of the words that you used, Julian and Kirsten, you used some similar ones um, when you were describing it, you know, as an ex-boyfriend. Um, but we, we can Your say, girlfriends can was, suck too. But. I was just going to, yeah. <laughs> no, it's just boys. I was just going to say, yeah, this is not a, it could be an ex-girlfriend also. Yeah. Just um, equal opportunity. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's, probably, it's more likely an ex-boyfriend to be clear, but it could also be an ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Uh, just, I'm just saying based on the odds of it. So. It, it, it that's fair. <laughs> um, someone's going to like give us a, a hard time about that. Or I'm just yeah. joking. Just to be clear. <laughs> um, so well, I was going to jump into something else, but Kirsten, if you wanted to add. Yeah. Um, I, I think we were in totally different parts of the business for a large part of our time there. And the part of the business that I was in was really close to the customer. Like we were in the heartbeat of revenue making. And so what it taught me was how to interact in real time environments, how value is added and exchanged very quickly and how money can flow very quickly if you're, if the motivation and the incentives are right. So I learned a ton uh, in my time there about incentives and how those drive behaviors way more than education or strategy or, um, you know, PowerPoint decks, <laughs> like incentives make the world go round. And that has been true both in entrepreneurship and in my tenure in corporate America. And so a lot of what Julian is talking about in terms of when people bend the truth or create certain frames around the story or certain narratives, it comes from how they're incentivized. Um, and so that is a very different way of looking at the world. And even now, from a money perspective, when I hear financial advice, it's the first place I go. It's like, what is this person's incentive in giving me that advice? <laughs> and if it's not aligned to mine, that's kind of my litmus test for whether I take it or not. And even when I give advice, I use the same, you know, the same kind of ruler to make sure that my incentives are aligned before I give this person advice. Um, I would also say that I learned uh, about what people get from work other than an income. So I was also in a part of the business where the tenure was 30, 40 years. Like people had spent their lifetimes at the company. It was more than just a job for them. It was an identity. It was a source of pride. It was, it was everything for them. And when you are talking to those types of people about change and, you know, company vision and there's new leadership and this is the way we're doing things, it is almost like an attack on their, their person, their personality. It's almost like an attack on their character. And so when you realize that and you start to promote something like FIRE, financial independence, retire early, people have very strong reactions to the notion that you would want to stop working. Like, what else is there to do? And so knowing that, knowing that, you know, being around people who have this attachment and this loyalty to work and this deeper meaning almost to like a religious spiritual level around the value of work has changed the way that I package our message now with Rich and Regular. I'm not so like bullish on you have to be this way to retire early or these are the rules or you're stupid if you go to work because I now know that there are people out there that like, it's bigger than just, you know, a paycheck. It's bigger than just a job. They get fulfillment from it. And so when you're talking about something that statistically has been proven to not be a lifelong, you know, venture, like we've talked about, you can see all the data around wages being stagnant and layoffs being prominent and companies not taking care of people through pensions or retirement or matching 401ks. When you're talking about stuff like that with people who feel like, no, this job is absolutely going to take care of me. It's a really interesting dynamic to talk about something that is so controversial, like retiring early. It really does have bad boyfriend vibes, right? It does. Because it's like, it's like, hey, you know, I know, I know you love this guy, but I don't know. Listen, I'm seeing these things. Yeah, there's on, some red flags here. You know what I mean? Like you're only getting your news from here. You're not on Facebook. <laughs> but, you know, on Facebook, man, he's liking these things that are suggestive that your interests may not be aligned. Um, yeah. So Kirsten, you said, you said two things I think are actually related and, and something that I find myself thinking about a lot, how companies really want their employees to identify themselves as part of the company, but also the incentives. So a company has an incentive 
to make people think that this is the only place that they they can succeed. This is the only place that you can find value and identity and meaning in your life. And and in some ways, they kind of like trick people into trapping them in a 30-year commitment to the company when they could be doing something else that's really fulfilling. And so one of the things that I, I think about a lot and, and, I, and I talk with people about is, you know, like you, I, I've had a lot of great learnings from corporate America. I think you build a lot of fantastic skills, but I don't think anybody should do it for a lifetime, you know, like do it for 10 years, have a great experience, then go do something else. For those who can't see, Julian's doing like a silent clap as you said that. <laughs> he didn't want to say hello. So he just did the... Yeah, no, it's true. It's we we constrain everything else. Like we can wrap our heads around 12 years of education, four years of college, eight years of medical school or whatever it is. I think it's four plus residency. Point is, like there are all these other time bound um, institutions in our society. But when it comes to work, like there's a theory that, you know, you work for 50 years and then you retire. But the retirement crisis is very real. And we are seeing right now that that logic just doesn't exist. Most people can't retire. Even at 70, 75, they're still working. They still have to generate some sort of income in order to survive. And at some point we need to wrap our heads around like what is an acceptable length of a career? Yeah. 20 years, 30 years feels fair. I've been working since I was 15. So <laughs> like, even if I worked 30 years and retired at 45, I feel like I've paid my dues. I've done my duty. I've learned everything I need to learn out of working for somebody else. And the reality is like, when you say I plan to retire by 45, people look at you like you're crazy. And it's mm -hmm. like, how is that? <laughs> how is that crazy? Yeah. Like. <laughs> No, I feel you. It is. Uh, I, I look at them like they're crazy. Um, I'm like, why are you wasting all your money? So you have to work until you're, you know, I want to dig into something a little bit. So first off, uh, people are listening to us. They cannot see us. For those who are not familiar, Mike and I are white, pretty, pretty white looking. I think that's obvious. Uh, Kirsten <laughs> and very and, white acting too. Also, in yeah. Case that wasn't we're, clear. We're, we're, and yeah. In case you couldn't tell, we're white. Um, Kirsten and Julian are black. And so I want to talk a little bit about just the differences in the experiences we had in corporate America and what was and wasn't maybe tied to race. And so just and just to kind of repeat some of the words you used, like uh, Julian, you in particular, you know, use some words like, you know, harmful, hurtful, painful, toxic. Um, like it, it's heartbreaking for me to even hear those words as a leader of people that anyone made you feel like that whole separate topic we could get into. But I'm curious how much you felt like your experience was, I don't even know if, what the right word is, impacted, tarnished, whatever the right word is, by race and your your race and the color of your skin. Yeah. So uh, obviously, um, you know, I've known you for years and so I wasn't really sure where or when we would get to that conversation. And I was thinking, all right, you know, which story do I tell? <laughs> um Right. Depends like, how much time you're willing to spend on with us. Yeah. I mean, and I, I even started breaking it down. I was like, all right, there are softball versions. There are absolutely horrific versions. Um, and there's a bunch in between. Um, but I think the one that I keep going back to, because I think it is uh, reflective of how deep this, this problem is. And by this problem, I mean um, bias within the workplace is I, I know for sure, too, but I want to say it, it might have been at least three different times throughout my 10 year um, experience working for that company that I was just flat out told that I wasn't hired for a role because I was black. Um, now, if you're hearing that and you're a white person, you're thinking, oh, my gosh, like, I can't believe that that somebody would be so bold. It was told to me explicitly using those words at least two times. And the third time, it was quite suggestive that that was what happened. But here's what makes this or this experience interesting. Black people were the ones to tell me that. They were black leaders that I was interviewing with that had told me that they didn't hire me because I was black. And the reason why was because of the way it would look. It would look as if they were showing favoritism to me as a black person. And so what that you got to think about what that does to someone that's young, that is qualified, that is capable. 
And quite honestly, I still found a way to progress over my 10 year career while I was there. But looking back, I think what that really speaks to is the depth of insecurity that even leaders in positions of power and influence feel working for a company who, listen, by most measures is still fairly progressive, right? And so even in a pretty good work environment, you've got black leaders who work in a city like Atlanta with access to talent, but still don't feel entirely comfortable hiring people that they think are the best fit if those people have the same skin color because of the optics of what it might look like because they don't because they clearly also feel the pressure within their organization to do some things now i know for a fact that i've even some people have taken it another way right they went ahead and hired white people because of the optics they wanted to come across as if hey i'm not playing favoritism therefore i'm going to hire this person the least likely person that you would think that i would hire Right. And so for someone like me who, you know, quite honestly, that ten thousand dollars, that fifteen thousand dollars, you know, is is meaningful. And so if for me, if that were the only if that were the opportunity that I knew I was a shoe in for. And a couple of times that was the case. And I'm, I'm glad it didn't work out because the reality is I don't want to work for leaders like that. Um, but at the same time, on a personal level, I understand. I understand yeah. that 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 complex quite deeply. And so. Um, yeah, listen, these are the types of conversations going back to your early statement about not wanting to talk about sort of, let's say the easy, what to say the, the fruit, the fruit okay. on the floor, low whatever hanging, the state, low hanging fruit. Hanging fruit. fruit. I like on the, the fruit floor. on the floor. Yeah, fruit, fruit on the floor. 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 That's, That's even, even better. Easier. That's even yeah. easier. You don't That's even, even have to pick it. It's just you laundry. can't eat no fruit on the floor in a pandemic. <laughs> of course you can. No. <laughs> if it's only been there for like a day, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. You just wash it off. Um, but no, like to me, it's like, cause it, listen, there's the money, but then there's the process of acquiring the money and what people need to go through to do that. Um, those are the conversations that I'm much more interested in, in, in having, obviously, you know, not every platform is equipped to have that, uh, type of discussion, but anyway, um, that I think is a, is a, is a story that, um, it's a, a collection of stories <laughs> that I think are interesting to me. You know, I've sort of gotten over the hurt, but now they're just interesting and they're they're the areas of exploration for me as a creative storyteller. Yeah. And I think for me, it was more around, um, especially with women, you know, we have all these like little professional development circles and mentorship programs and every, you know, every meeting there is an executive in our case, usually white, telling you about their origin story. And it's like, you know, this person took a chance on me or I met with such and such. And they said that they saw a lot of themselves in me. And like, those are experiences that I've never had as a black girl. There's never been a white woman who says, you know what? I see a lot of myself in you because it's hard. It's hard to look at a black girl and be like, yes, we obviously have a lot in common, even though I knew we did. And I would have to work extra hard to like prove that like, oh no, we have a lot in common. I like that too. I felt the same way in the meeting. Like I would have to kind of extend myself. Like it's almost like you're not allowed to be introverted as a black girl or awkward (laughs) because you have to constantly show that we have things in common. And there's never been, you know, a, a, time where I felt like someone took a chance on me. Like I always felt like I was overqualified or specifically groomed for a role that I was in. It was never like you're completely unqualified, but I think that, you know, you're, you be good. I feel like you could learn it on the go. Like that wasn't a luxury that was afforded to me or any of my black peers where it's just like, no, you either need to be very specifically like you're the obvious choice or you need to work extra hard and participate in all the extracurriculars and show up for all of the extra things and go to the fireside chats and sign up to clean up the cups after the meet and greet breakfast. Like you are constantly trying to be visible, even though like you should be visible. Like it ain't but, you know, a handful of black people there. Like you should be visible. So um, it was just, I just felt like I was always performing And when I left, like that was the biggest part that I had to like unlearn was that I could build a business and make a lot of money without performing. I could build a business being myself and it wouldn't feel like 
work because the work itself was never the hard part for me. Again, I was prepared and well read and I had degrees and experience like the work itself of the building of the decks and the making of the revenue like that was never the hard part. It was all the other performing that I had to do to be considered qualified to build the decks and do the revenue and all that. (laughs) Like it was, it was that part that was the exhausting part. And so shedding that after I left was about a year long process. It took a while to like sift through all the noise and like find my actual voice again. You know, I I love the term performing that you used And, and obviously our, our experiences and the level of performing that you and I have had to do is going to be vastly different. But I think one of the things that, really kind of sucks about corporate America is that everybody has to perform. Everybody has to, you know, like dress up in their business costume and they have to act a certain way that's not their normal self. And that could be a real drag. And so it's, it's great to hear that in leaving corporate America, you have found an escape from that. Yeah. And I, I, it's funny that you hit on the perform word, Mike, because I, I heard the same thing and, and I've heard that from a lot of people. We've been having a lot of conversations particularly over the past year, very frank, candid conversations that we never had at our company. Um, and I, I can't think of the phrase and, and other words that people use, but they were essentially saying what you, what you were just saying, Kirsten, about having to perform and having to almost like show up and turn on a different self to assimilate and in any way be successful and not just be viewed as like not playing the game. I don't even know the right way to phrase it, but I think you know what I mean. And I, and I think Mike's right. It's interesting because not, and, and I want to be really clear. I am not saying I can relate to you on this front. I'm trying to kind of say how, how bad it must be for you because I feel like I have to perform and I don't mean perform, like do a good job. I mean, like I have to act a certain way and I need to, you know, assimilate and, you know, like learn the, just the, just the language and the code of everything. And, um, and so I, I can, imagine having to do that, you know, on 10 more layers when um, there's just, you know, we, we'll talk about it more, but just a lot of unconscious bias and the, the sorts of things where, you know, Julian, when your response is like, you know, I got to decide which story to share because there's so many, right. Is, you know, I can just imagine, I think, I guess I'm what my long-winded uh, point here, if there is one at all yeah, is. What are you trying to say? I'm Megan? not sure. I'm trying to say, I also, I agree with your point. I agree with what everyone's saying. <laughs> are you just saying that you that agree I, with something I already said? I, yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. With all of you. I, but, mean, I think, I, I think the difference is it goes back to incentives. Like it yeah. works. Like if performing works, if performing lands you yeah. in, the, in the role that you want and on the team that you like and you know with the responsibilities and the budget that you're performing for then you're incentivized to keep doing it but when you perform and there is no result or the result is a slap on the wrist is that how the phrase goes slap on the wrist yeah I think slap so. on the hand I don't slap, slap on, on the wrist, wrist. Yeah, sounds yeah, slap funny. on the wrist when you <laughs> okay. bend down to the floor one. to pick up the fruit <laughs> yeah you still, yeah yeah, that's what... I've lost all my jargon. <laughs> a slap on the neck, then, <laughs> then you you become less likely to do it. And I think this is where some of the stories, especially with you know black people and the black people that we talk to, black professionals, start to <clears throat> excuse me, the stories start to arise because you know they've lost the incentive to do it. And so when we stop doing it and we start becoming truth tellers. Um, then things change and it no longer is an environment that's welcoming or even beneficial to be in. Julian, your, your example, when you were talking about, you know, being told at least a few times that you didn't get a role because you were black. I was really surprised when you went to say that that was from a black leader and why, and the, which I'm, when, once I hear it, I'm not surprised. I just wouldn't have predicted that that's what you were going to say. And I think that's interesting because that even goes back to, Uh, kind of the point we made around just the idea of kind of how money is tied into this and being able to um, have the confidence to be yourself and do what you want to do and do what you know is right. And unfortunately, a lot of people aren't in that position, right? So, so they're, they're, you know, that's their livelihood for their kids and their family. And so they're trying to, they're worried about optics, right? They're they're And and that's why I say like, it's hard to even blame is not the right word, but you, you can empathize with where they're coming from in that which is one of the many, many reasons why I personally find such great joy from getting like living my life in a way where I can get to a place where I don't have to worry about that stuff. 
you guys have, have tapped into at least two of the chapters that are in our book. So the first one um, was around, you know, what, what we think the appropriate length of a career would be, right? So we just, you know, we told people, that since people, they need instruction or they need, you need a number, fine, I'll give you a number and here's my rationale. And here are a couple of examples from real people who've done it that have each taken a different path to getting there, um, have at it, right? Um, but the second one is... I lost my train of thought. Forgot you what said you were, two what, chapters in your book. Yeah, I forgot the last thing that you just that you just that you were just talking about. Just the financial freedom around the ability to leave. Yeah, it's going to come to me like in the middle of another sentence know. or something. But, but yeah, it, it, it was. I think it was. It was just around the the motivations, the underlying motivations for sort of pursuing financial independence, right? It doesn't, all, it, it, this isn't in all cases an endeavor in building wealth for the purposes of going to sit on a beach somewhere and do nothing. That might be something that you do, but in a lot of cases it could be, hey, like you wanna insulate yourself from the realities of these environments, right? You know, you're walking into something, you know, they're imperfect. What we're asking people to do is to sort of accept that imperfection on the front end. Um, and these are the things that you can do to protect yourself. Um, from a, a disruption to your career, which could have a downstream impact on your income and your marriage and your ability to raise your children, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it sucks. Um, and, and now I remember what it was. It was like, it was also accepting the fact that there's very little incentive, I think, for these companies to, to change. You know, I mean, like, at the end of the day, if you hit your numbers, you hit your metrics, shareholders are happy, the board's happy, the customers are happy. If someone comes and says, hey, we need to sort of tweak the operational and organizational charts a little bit in order to make these people happy or to sort of check these boxes, there's just very little, um, I believe, uh, incentive to Kirsten's point for them to do that. And so, you know, if what they're doing is working, if anything, let's keep doing more of that. And so I think what we're, we're really trying to challenge people to do is just sort of accept that. Stop. Don't don't commit to spending the next 15 to 20 years of your life hoping that these companies, dare I say, do the right thing and just, you know, chart your own path and, you know, to, 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 to freedom. So on that note, I'm curious, would you recommend like to a young person, you know, in their 20s, getting out of college, that could go get a job in corporate America, like, would you recommend it for a period of time to, you know, bank some good money and then yes. get some? I would, I would absolutely recommend it, but I would tell them to parallel path developing their own income sources. So the way that the world is set up today without consistent income, everything is harder. So health insurance, you gotta buy, you know, on the, on the market and it's super expensive. If you ever wanted a mortgage or even a car note or a credit card, you have to provide proof of income. I mean, we're learning this as entrepreneurs who have plenty of money in the bank and steady income coming in, uh, that if your income is too lumpy or too different from what the algorithms are set up as, which at this point are biweekly cadences of deposits, then you're flagged and it just becomes much harder for you. So I would 100% recommend that people go into corporate America or some sort of formal career early in life to at least understand how it works, but then have an exit plan. Like don't go in there planning to build your identity and get fulfillment from this institution. Like know the purpose and place it's gonna play in your life. Yeah, it's a means to an end. I would add to that, do not um, confuse, let's say, your negotiated salary or wage with your full earning potential. Yeah, or your worth. All right, those are two completely different things. Yes. Um, and we've learned that uh, and then some uh, as entrepreneurs. And, you know, the, and that's part of what we mean by inspiring better conversations about money is we have all of this coded language for earning, right? You make good money. And it's like, well, that, that's such a general- <laughs> Compared to what? <laughs> compared to what, right? Like I didn't know my full worth until you started to step out and earn money on your own, right? And then you realize, well, hey, if I can make, you know, you've got a choice. I can either keep bumping my head into this wall and hoping that things go well and I get the 10 to $15,000 raise that I'm looking for, or I can invest heavily and get my raise that way, or I can invest in real estate and get my raise that way, or I can launch a product, right? And grow that, or I can just agree to sign up, write a book 
You know what I mean? And so those are the things, those are the lessons that we've learned over the last couple of years. Um, and, and that is the advice that I would give anyone else if they're interested in moving into corporate America. It's interesting because um, we spoke at Auburn last year. I remember. Uh, it was a part of their program for diversity and inclusion. And there were a lot of HR recruiters in the audience and they basically came in questioning us like, listen, we like a lot of our candidates know about fire. They know about, you know, digital nomad and lap, life, laptop lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And so they go into these interviews and they're unprepared with the hiring manager and the hiring manager doesn't end up hiring them because they're so clear and vocal about the life that they want. Like they want to be remote workers. And obviously this was pre pandemic, but like (laughs) these people have the audacity to say, I don't want to come into an office every day. What is your advice for young people? And it's like, I mean, we don't, (laughs) we don't give advice on how to be better interviewers for a system that has proven to not work. Like (laughs) it's, it's interesting um, how we, we, another thing we talk about in the book is the pace of change and how quickly like younger generations can really create a movement and change the way that things work. And when we talk about work not being this lifetime endeavor, like these young people see it that way. When you couple that with like AI and like robots and not to get it all futuristic, but like I'm pretty sure companies will start to see that employees there's a lifetime value of an employee, just like there's a lifetime value of a customer and they will no longer be incentivized to keep you on as long as possible. It's really just to kind of milk you for what they need at the moment. And then milk you sounds so violent, but (laughs) milk you for what you need in the moment and then replace you with, you know, the newer version. Like that's the way our cell phones work. Why wouldn't employees work the same way? Some yeah. matrix. Uh, that was very matrix. <laughs> We've got so many good uh, phrases from tonight of uh, the fruit on the floor milking you. Okay. On the, on the same topic, but I want to uh, kind of take us in a different direction for a minute. And this is eventually going to turn into a question. If you haven't, uh, if you can't tell yet, sometimes my questions take a minute to get to. And one of our uh, interviewees, actually, um, it was uh, Kate Flanders, actually, who she said, oh, you're just sharing context, Maggie. You're not long winded. And I was like, oh, thanks. That's very kind of you. Um, Mike critiques me for it, but you just made it sound like a uh, nice quality of mine. Anyways, I got a lot of context to build up to this, which I think is is helpful and you might find interesting. So we interviewed John on Wuchekwa back in December. And do you, do you know who he is? No. Oh, we love him. You should follow him on Instagram. He is the pa- he's he's fr- uh, not from Atlanta. He lives in Atlanta, but he is the pastor of Cornerstone Church in Atlanta. And oh yes, he he founded Plywood. Um, not sorry, not Plywood. He has spoke at Plywood people, yes, but he founded Portrait Coffee, which is a black owned uh, local Atlanta uh, coffee roaster. They've been doing crazy in the past year since they launched too. Um, anyways, he we interviewed him and he shared one of the most insightful comments that I've heard in a long time. And I was asking, what are some of the things that we can do, like people like me can do to help and start solving for systemic racism and all of the problems in the world that we've been talking about. And he basically was saying like, I can't tell you things. He said, you need to, you need to understand the problems. And, and, and to quote him, he said, you know, the people who have done the most significant work are the people who have spent the most time understanding the nature of the problem. He said, by the time you truly dive deep and see how far things really go, they then have, or by the time people dig that deep, they then have a million action items they can take, right? They're not spending time saying, what can I do? Because they've spent the time to invest and learn. And I'm I'm off quoting him at this point, but they've spent the time to uh, learn and invest and really understand. And he talked about basically the idea of like a willingness to help needs to be met with wisdom. And I, I really liked his point there and his kind of broader point. So I want to kind of build off that insight and ask you a question, um, building off of your wisdom. You also said something in your Money on the Table series where you said, what we do in this moment is critical. Given that you have been inside corporate America for a combined two decades across both of you, and you have the wisdom of understanding the problem, what do you think needs to change? Because you just, and I'm going to, I'm going to give you this, but I just want to add one thing. We just talked a lot about sort of just being like, look, suck it up and go do it for 10 years and kind of compartmentalize and understand the place it 
plays in your life and the place it doesn't play and use it for what it's good for. But what could change? What could make it better? I have not thought this through in detail, um, but I have given it a good bit of thought. And it's a daring sort of proposal. But I think um, it's time to reevaluate um, the value of employee retention programs as a whole. I think companies as a whole, you know, might be significantly more, well, one, they would be leaner if they just stopped trying to pretend to be our friends and our family um, and trying to sort of encourage us to, you know, create all these programs and forced fun and all of that stuff. Imagine a world where we really just started to embrace the true nature of this relationship, which is a transaction, right? Um, which requires both parties, all parties, to sort of own up to that um, and say, hey, it is what it is. Um, I'm going to come. I'm going to do. Uh, this is the price in exchange for my labor. This is going to be my contribution. This is where it starts and this is where it ends. Um, I feel like just given the number of people that I know that really hate the fluff, I feel like that could actually be be pretty helpful if we just decided to be honest about it and said, hey, let's just do that and sort of reappropriate the funding in other places. It could be in wages. It could be in, um, I, I don't know, right? But just like- Well, it works like that in other countries. Like if you go to Europe, you sign an employee employment contract. Yeah. And again, you're both incentivized. You're incentivized to stay and they're incentivized not to let you go because of the nature of that contract. Yeah. If we could move to a model that- other developed countries are using from maternity leave to in healthcare and not to get political, but like there, there are examples. And so when people are like confused to, to John's point, when people are confused about where to start, it's like, well, I can tell you haven't done your research yet because there, there are examples of com- of countries, of, of places in the world where this isn't as much of an issue. It is a specific to the U S mm-hmm thing yeah specific to the u.s well no and it's it's, it's also <laughs> this obsession with with optimization too right so i think there's you know there's just a lot of work to be done there it's like we companies as a whole like this like this is the stuff that i'm actually really really interested about it's 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 part how do companies um motivate a financially independent workforce right which is a big question to me um but i think in terms of just optimization we want to optimize things well you know, op- optimize time, right? Like stop, stop with the BS, stop wasting time with all these things that most people don't really enjoy anyway, right? And then with that flexibility, I think you can give other people that extra day. Imagine if you had, oh the, imagine if you had a, a four day, day work, work week. week. You guys right? know I just moved to a four day work week. I saw that. Congrats. And I was just talking to somebody and they were asking me about it. And I was like, you know, what's cut out all the fluff. All the I'm fl- just like, I'm doing as much work in a short, right. I, I'm now just much more focused and motivated to like get my right. shit done in a shorter amount of time. But I think what employees would then do or is, is to now you can sort of give people the capacity to actually create change. Right. And so in however they want to do right? That long list of problems that you've identified after digging deep and exploring the world for all of the social ills. Now you've got a full day, right? That you can use going forward. It doesn't have to be a seasonal thing. You can do it whenever you want. You can give back more to the community. You can, you know, do whatever you want. I just think that that like sort of loosening the, the, the sort of chains of, of the standard work week could just help create the capacity that all of these different families and individuals and communities could then use to help solve some of the problems that are just persistent. We don't have the time to fix any of this shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so like, you know, let's figure out how to sort of break work down a little bit to the bare essentials to create the capacity and the funding for people to do the things that they actually want to do. It's fascinating to me that you just said, like your first comment, Julian, was like, well, I haven't really thought about this. So you just threw something out the cup. But that's like a a big, bold, disruptive thought that you just shared. And, and, And I don't I don't know how much you guys remember this, but like I spend a lot of time at work dealing with culture. And I've ended up in these roles where like I'm the one creating all that stuff. That I that we think makes people happy and we think people want. And so, and that's why I say that's a compliment when I say that's a big, bold, disruptive thought of there's something there, right? There is something in what you just said that I 
quite honestly have not, I've now spent about 60 seconds thinking about it since you were just talking and it's like starting to blow my mind of the possibilities. Yeah. I mean, when you think about the work schedule that we're on, it's from the industrial revolution. Like it is old. It is a, it is a schedule that came to us when we were still like in factories and coal mines, like all the time. And when the world had just shifted from like being agricultural to now being industrial, it's time to revisit it. Like, and if any time is better than any, like the pandemic has caused the ability to revisit it and just think about like, what are the natural cycles of like a modern knowledge worker? It's not nine to five, Monday through Friday. Like that doesn't make any sense anywhere. And I think people are are saying that now where it's just like this, literally does not make any sense. We're doing it. It would be like having a coal oven or something. Is that, is that I, yeah. I had no faith in your ability to learn that. <laughs> it would I be knew. like having fruit on the floor and then having to milk it. You know? I knew five seconds before that plane took off that it was doomed. I wish we were on video for this so people could see your faces as we're having this discussion. Uh, it'd be like milk and an orange. Like It makes no sense. <laughs> That actually worked out well, Kirsten. I, if you can milk an almond, you yeah. can definitely milk an orange. So, Maggie, so I think that. we need to make the the title of this episode something about our use of metaphors, because <laughs> I, I we, we've collectively we, we must have dropped a hundred. Yeah, we're doing good. Hour. We're it's a, it's a solid this, solid this, take. This is corporate, baby. This, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're gonna play corporate bingo after this. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny is, Mike. I know you haven't like spoken up on particularly on th- this particular point, but I feel like you, Mike, is in the target market of like he doesn't need all that fluff. He's like, what do you want me to do? I'm gonna do a good job. Um, and and there certainly are people who I think we think need it, but I yeah. I think it's worth revisiting. I mean, I think you're right. And that's why I say like there, there is something big in what you just said. I actually have thought about it more than I probably give myself credit for, because I think I even went as far as saying giving people the option. Right. So you you can choose either an extra day, let's say an extra amount of money or, you know, additional money that you can use to help pay off debts or accelerate investments or a contribution to a fund. Like I, 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 instead of the catalog where you can get like instead of an engraved a watch and a vacuum watch. <laughs> I have a hammock on my deck that I got. <laughs> we got a shop back. Shop back. <laughs> so let me let me ask you guys a question. Let's say, and I know you guys left corporate America because of a lot of the the things that we've talked is about. Is this about that a shop back? For you. No, this is not a shop okay, back. Sorry, just check. I'm so, just checking. I want to keep us in. Go, keep going. So you, you left because there were a lot of things that didn't agree with your lifestyle that you didn't like about corporate America. But what happened? What would happen hypothetically if the things that you're talking about right now, you actually found in a company? So you there was a company that approached you, and they're like, "Listen, we don't have any fluff. We're really transactional. We want to make you happy, but you know, we're not going to f- feed you with a bunch of bullshit." And there was also appropriate representation in the leadership for you guys, and a, and a culture that you appreciated. Would you consider going back to corporate America if those issues were addressed? You could argue that we kind of just signed that agreement um, that solved for all of those things, replaced our former corporate income, but really only requires about a day and a half of our time. I am in such suspense. I know you're not going to tell us what you're talking about, but I just want you to know the more information you feed me, the more I just want to know. So, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a partnership, right? It's not, it's not traditional employment. It's a partnership. It's, Hey, I value your skills. I value what you're doing. Would you consider doing this? This is all we're asking for. This is where it stops. You're not a part of this company and the culture. You don't have, you know what I mean? But we want you to be a part of this family because we value what you do. Right. So as an entrepreneur, I have the ability to do that. I have the, the freedom to do everything that I am bound by contractually over the next four months. And if I'm done by April, I can take the rest of the year off. There's no requirement for me to continue to be there because I fulfilled my obligation. I agree with what I'm paid. In fact, I agree with the, the compensation package. I can negotiate it much more you know, creatively 
than I could in the standard traditional uh, process of employment, right? And so this is arguably another part of the book that we're, we're, we're sort of pushing for. It's like, we need to start exploring that like more people need more experience with this because I actually think this is the direction a lot of these companies are going with. IHG is a great example. You know this, right? I, and I'm sure HR probably has that data, but if you look at the percentage of, let's say, money that goes to contractors and how that has increased over the years, right? And it's like, it's actually a lot easier to get things done through those types yeah. of agreements than it is to deal with people who are formal employees and they have arguably all this baggage and expectations, <laughs> right? Because they've consumed the promise and they're actually going to try to hold you accountable for it and say, like, hey, get out of here. But it's almost like a false prompt you know yeah correct yeah and so yeah I, I, it's again it's 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 sort of removing the romance it is removing the it's romance. removing the romance yeah. from, and that's from the hard part employment. we just spoke to um a large tech company we spoke to their black employee resource group and in the pre-calls <laughs> with this tech company uh we were talking with the ladies and they were like listen i know you guys are like anti-career but i promise these are the happiest black people on earth <laughs> Many of them are first time multimillionaires because of the recent IPO. And like, we don't have any issues with diversity or inclusion or like these people are super happy. What advice do you give them? And it's like exact same advice because at the end of the day, a company is not your manager. Like a company is beholden to shareholders. And at the end of the day, if shareholders want something different or if the world changes and there's now an incumbent competitor with your technology, things will change. We are old enough to say that at this point. We're not some, you know, 20 somethings that got super rich off of a game stock like short. Like we are actually people who have lived through this and know that companies are an institution just like every other institution. So I think to your point, Mike, like my advice would would be the same. And if I were to go back to corporate because they had all of these things and I could save $1,100 a month on healthcare and have a very flexible schedule, then yeah, I would, I might go back into it, but it would be with the same mindset that I'm using now where it's like, this is really just to stack up, you know, $25,000 over two years <laughs> that I'm currently spending on healthcare or $40,000 if they have a daycare benefit. Like there are some benefits in like, you know, going back to to a regular job. But at the end of the day, like I would still look at it as transactional and not some sort of lifetime commitment, which is not romantic. But listen, hookup culture is real. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the metaphors. Um, I know. <laughs> listen, you know, trying to milk an orange is a real problem people have. <laughs> If you can milk an almond, I stand by that. Like, that's going to be on somebody's gonna, poster. There's going to be like orange milk advertising in the next Super Bowl. Somebody's going to be at their desk like, if I can milk an almond, I can milk an orange. <laughs> <laughs> when we quote you uh, on some social posts after this, we'll be like, yes. Kirsten said that was our best takeaway. <laughs> okay. So I, I don't want to just awkwardly shift from what was I think a really fast, for me at least, a really fascinating discussion on corporate America and race. And, and I say fascinating, but I know, Julianne, you just touched the surface in some of your examples, but it, it, that's not fascinating. That's really sad and heartbreaking to hear. And it's one of the many things I would like to see change. And I'm certainly doing uh, the best I can do at my part to change it um, from the type of role that I am in. But I, I want to shift to wrapping this up because we want to be respectful of your time um, and just get a little bit of a sense of kind of where you guys are at now, what projects you're focused on and what you're most excited about. I know you've kind of mentioned a few throughout the discussion, but like, what are you guys most excited about right now? Where are you headed? Yeah, I feel bad for bringing up our book uh, because it's going to be a while before that thing is available. <laughs> um, we've learned, if there's one thing we've learned, um, the traditional publishing process is really, really mm -hmm. slow. Um, but on top of that, we did just go through a year where everyone's sort of pivoting with the pandemic. And so everything is pretty much delayed. So we're anticipating even further delays, but that's fine because it's given us the, um, the capacity to, uh, and the freedom to kind of explore other things. I think uh, the next thing 
uh, that we're most excited about is Money on the Table season two. We're starting to have um, early discussions about that. And that's basically um, our series that we launched on YouTube. We originally intended on having very candid conversations like this with friends and people that we've met within the fire community, um, because we've actually found that those are the real conversations. Like when I'm hanging out with all of these other personalities and there's flies on the wall and, or, and not their flies on the wall, but <laughs> I was like, why are there flies on the wall? <laughs> because we're in this, like this really dingy place. <laughs> yeah. There's all fruit all over the floor. Fruit right, all over the fruit floor. The, they're fruit flies. <laughs> I get it. They're fruit flies. Okay. Yeah. They're fruit flies uh, at the bar, um, which is a very real thing, but um, no, it was when we realized that, you know, being a fly on the wall in, in some of these conversations were, was actually where the really juicy stuff was. It was like, you know what, that's what I want to share with people. Um, and there's nothing better than being able to just, you know, cook for someone. And the, the idea literally so crazy, but we were in New York with Grant Sabatier and Vicky Robin. And I don't know why I just said I wanted to cook for you, Vicky. And um, I was like, if I cook for you, what would you want me to make? And she said she wanted whiskey and an English trifle. And I said, well, if you ever come to Atlanta, that's exactly what I'm going to make for you. And so that was like the beginning of the idea. And I was like, ah, I should record that conversation. I like it. Yeah. And, you know, because she's a fantastic woman, a brilliant woman. And who says English trifle? When I know. Like, I, I was confused when she said she wanted whiskey. I was like, is that a meal? You. But, right. for her but yeah. the, the epicurean in me was so like i was i was enamored with her in that moment and so you know that was really the original idea so now for season two we really want to get out there this is assuming we can get uh you know vaccinated and other people can do the same and that we can take the necessary precautions we really want to travel get out there have these conversations document them and share them with people around the world because we've learned through this process that conversations are such valuable platforms for learning. Obviously, as podcasters, you know that. But I think even on a more personal level, if you think about the way that we learn from our parents, is typically through conversation. Your parents don't write a book on how to be a boy or a girl or a nice person. They just talk Show to you. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so we realize that, wow, that's actually how most people learn about money. And so we wanted to sort of replicate that Um obviously in, in a different way and in a way that was more fun for a second insight, which is that I actually believe Americans value being entertained more so than they value being educated. Um, and so why not try to entertain them and give them an opportunity to learn in the process? So we're really excited about season two. Uh, and then the other thing that we're excited about this year, we actually can't talk about. <laughs> it's a new. God, it's a, there more. It is. It's a big year. There's a new. There are two things that we can't talk about, but one of them is a completely different website that we are in the very early stages of building um, that we think will help a lot of people in, along their journey. Um, and the second one will likely announce in the next few weeks. Maybe Exciting. when I'm editing this show, I'll just put beeps over it. So it sounds like you told us. <laughs> you were like, well, we'll tell you, but yeah. we can't talk. I'll tell you, but basically we just <laughs> beep, beep, beep. <laughs> I, I want to just uh, throw out a, a compliment. Um, I love the show and we will put a link in the show notes. Thank you. you, know, oh, thank you. The, I, I love food shows. I love talking about money. <laughs> and so, you know, just from like a, a production standpoint, the way you guys like intercut the like the cooking and the talking and the way the conversation flows and kind of jumps around, but is, is cohesive. Uh, it's just fantastic. So, you know, kudos, it's, it's great. And I, I love the idea for, for season two. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that coming out at some point in the future. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> when, it, it's, we stole a page from a uh, Seinfeld a comedian in a car getting coffee. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the vibe that we're, that we're going for. Um, and so hopefully, but instead of like me, you know, buying or, you know, having a car that reminds me of Mike and Maggie. It's like, all right, I know Maggie is from wherever and I'm going to make something that reminds Atlanta. me of her. Atlanta. So I'm going to make a hot whatever dog. Atlanta's eat. Ew, not a hot dog. <laughs> a You're such a good show. You're vegan. Make, oh, I, even, even if I wasn't vegan. I oh gosh, you're vegan then. Never mind. You can't be a guest. You're not even going to cook for me. I know. I'll no. go vegetarian for your. I would, I would, I would go deep in exploring that. That would be the fun part for me. And it's like I learned something in the process. You learned something, and yeah, I think like that it. just makes it more interesting. Not to mention, 
from a marketing standpoint. You just get people who otherwise would never tune into personal finance content. That was the underlying thing. It was like, well, don't make it look like personal finance content. They think they're getting recipes. The next thing you know, they're learning about index funds. And to change the game on like what we mean when we say money conversations. I think people have like a very like rigid image in their mind about yeah, like it's a spreadsheet it's a spreadsheet yeah. somebody's presenting it's very serious there's and wine like, involved in your money conversation <laughs> yeah casual and they're, fr- they're funny yeah which is how you know when when you're a couple like every conversation about money isn't a serious one yeah. like sometimes you're just ranting about towels expensive musty musty towels <laughs> musty, musty towels yeah. are like we just talked about how expensive frozen fries have gotten like i also cool. have bamboo towels which i'm pretty sure is what you have because that's what makes them anti-musk and it is very worth the investment they're super soft thank you i hope you're going to switch over soon julian you don't look you don't look okay we'll just keep moving <laughs> Uh, I also agree. Um, I, I will say just even you were talking about the production quality. When I was telling my husband, I'm like, oh, I want to, they, he knows who you guys are. You guys have met him a couple of times. And mm-hmm. I was saying, I was like, oh, I want, we're going to watch the, you know, Money on the Table series. I've been meaning to watch it forever. And we sat down last weekend and like watched them all. And he was like really impressed. He was like, oh, I thought this was going to be like some homemade YouTube video. Um, <laughs> he And he was like, this is like watching a TV show. This is great. This could be on Netflix. The, the thing I will say, though, that I ju- is just a random comment. Um, but when you first said fruit on the floor, it, it immediately made me think of one of, I think, my favorite scene from every uh, one of your first six episodes was your mom and the breadfruit. When she's basically trying to tell you, like, it, like you messed it up and I cannot deal with this. She, she was just like, I can't do it. I'm not doing it. And it finally you agreed. And she was like, thank you. I don't remember her response, but... It was hilarious how much she was giving, really giving oh, you a hard time about the bread. She had no idea. Everybody loves that episode. That's everybody's favorite episode. Yeah. She has to be, I guess, on episode one because it's She's like, great. I don't want yeah. back. She was great. <laughs> she was she so was great. mean. It was she a was. good dynamic. It worked for you. I will never cook for her again. Uh, I want to be like, your son's like an amazing chef. He's like done this professionally. She's like, nah. like, cut him some slack, you know? She's like, yeah, no, I know, I know more about breadfruit than you do. And like, yeah. You have failed. There was no like, uh, so anyways, I thought you did a, a solid job. I don't know what breadfruit's supposed to look like, but it seemed like you did a good job with it. It was, it was inedible. inedible. He did. Yeah. She wasn't even willing to work with it. You were like, well, still, we'll just, it won't be as good, but we'll just, and she was like, no, no. And then when you, when she, when you guys like gave, she was like, you know, like so excited, like, yes, I won. I won this competition. Okay. Yes. <laughs> we're at time. It's nine eighteen. We're going to do a 60 second speed round. We like to sometimes do like a Mike's minute on the mic. We're going to do a Julian and Kirsten's minute on the mic. We're going to ask you two quick questions. Both of you get to answer just real okay. quick on the fly. Not You don't need long answers. As a chef, Julian, former chef, and I still consider you a chef. Uh, you're doing it professionally on money on the table now. And Kirsten, as an eater of food, what is your favorite meal to cook for the other person? Steak. I don't really cook for Julian because he doesn't I, know how to accept <laughs> accept my like his meal mom, as he, it is. Just yeah, like he, he got is it from his very mom. Very much like his mother. It's so I I make cocktails okay. and I make a great Manhattan. That's great. Okay. Drinks count. <laughs> All right. Second speed round question. What is your favorite money or lifestyle related topic to talk about with each other? Hmm. I love to talk about income, like making money. I think people have such hangups around making money and they place these limits on themselves and every financial problem they have is framed around the amount of money that they make. And so when you say, what if you just found $5,000 more every year, would that solve it? And it's like, pfft, their mind like <laughs> explodes. <laughs> that was a bomb sound. It might've sounded like me spitting in the microphone, but it was actually like a exploding head. I'll add a sound effect in post. <laughs> I would say index funds because as someone that has um, obviously, you know, is quite familiar with them, we invest in them um, primarily. Um, but it's always interesting when you witness someone else having that aha moment. I had that moment just the other day, a friend of mine, you know, who I've known for over 15 years, reached out and called and asked because he'd heard me mention it. And then when I actually helped him understand what it was and how it differed from a standard mutual fund, 
um, and how that could have an impact on his ability to retire earlier than he might uh, have assumed. It, it, it just felt really good to, 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 to help just him understand it. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I think just from a brand perspective, it it proves our point around some people just needing things to be framed in a way that they are already familiar with. Um, right. That those books haven't been written yet. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking specifically to and on behalf of black people like they need things written and said in a way that just resonate with what they already understand. We call that meeting people where they are. Right. Yeah. And so that's what we're trying to do. And it's like you already understand these ideas. It's just that if I frame it up, you know, in the idea of a latte factor, you can like, I don't, I don't drink latte. So get out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. It's like, how do we make this stick? We call it the glue. And so what we're trying to do is figure out what that sort of cultural and social glue is. What are those stories that need to be told and use that to help people um, to make big ideas stick? Yeah, I love it. Fun fact. I didn't know about index funds till I was about 35, 36 one of my biggest regrets is not putting money in the stock market when I was younger. Cause same. I'd have a lot more money now. Yeah. Same. Um, okay. I appreciate your time. You guys have been awesome. We have really enjoyed this discussion and we just want to thank you for coming on and talking about oranges and milk, milking <laughs> yeah. things, and fruit flies, on the flies <laughs> yeah. on the wall. I learned yes. so many great metaphors. Not really sure what else we talked about, but man, slap metaphors on the really neck. stuck with me. Slap yeah. on the wrist. Yeah, now I'm going to slap people on the neck instead of the wrist. I learned yeah. what I'm supposed to do. Um, but, but seriously, you guys are amazing to share some of your time with us. I know it is at a premium these days. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks thank for you. having us. You guys are great. Great job. Bye, Kirsten. Bye, Julian. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Mike. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you've been challenged or inspired by what you've heard today, please rate and review the show. You can also subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode. If you have thoughts or questions, we would love to hear from you, and you can leave us a voicemail or text us at 404-981-3370, or you can hit us up on Instagram or Facebook.